Well, oh, I can start. Perfect. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Helen. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Nomad Homes, which is an Astrolabs company. And today's topic is really women in tech. Um, and so first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for joining as well as the Astrolabs team for putting this on organizing and having me as a guest speaker. Um, in terms of what I'd like to cover today, I have some slides and some prepared talking points, but after that, you know, I'd love to open it up to Q&A and really turn this into a discussion um, for anybody who's looking to start a company or trying to join a tech company or is in technology. Um, and the other piece I would say is that supporting women in technology is not only important for women to support women in technology, but also for men to support women as well. Um, so I saw that we had quite a few men on this call and that makes me really excited. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And let me know if you cannot see that. Perfect. All right, so as I had said before, um, you know, I like to keep things pretty casual. So if you have any questions or you have a point to make, please feel free to just um, interject really. Um, a little bit of background on myself. Uh, again, my name is Helen Chen. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Nomad Homes. Um, and today I'll be sharing my experiences as a female tech entrepreneur and the lessons that I've learned to help others navigate and thrive in the industry. Um, and I hope that if you're interested in tech or working in tech, this session will give you some practical advice and some tips uh, that you can take away and implement as part of your day-to-day -day and your career path. Cool. So we're gonna get going. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes first. So it says, entrepreneurship is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. I would say what Nomad Homes does is we are a property technology company, which means we're helping our customers, both buyers and renters, find their perfect home uh, online. And traditionally, real estate is an offline business, and now we're trying to bring it online uh, just because everyone is accustomed to using their phone and also smartphone penetration across this region is incredibly high. So that means our customers are ready to go from that perspective. Um, but what I really like about this quote is that it's 99% perspiration. And so starting a company and this idea of you know, bringing real estate online that's pretty common knowledge at this point. Um, so it's really about your execution, your perseverance, and how much are you willing to push in order to make this company a success. Great, uh, a little bit about myself. So I think you heard a little bit about me, um, but I would say the first thing is I consider myself a CEO and an entrepreneur first, and I am a woman CEO and an entrepreneur second. And I think that's really important because when you talk about supporting women in tech, it shouldn't be supporting women for the sake of supporting women. I believe that, you know, when I talk about myself, I don't, I don't think that I should get special preference because I am a woman. It's really because I'm an entrepreneur and a CEO, and I believe that Nomad Homes is really solving one of our customers' pain points in finding their perfect home. A little bit more about myself. Um, I am 29, so I am under 30. Um, as you can probably tell from the looks of me, I'm Chinese American, and you can also probably tell that from my accent. Um, and I am a female CEO of a tech company that services Europe and the Middle East. Um, I think for me, what I often try and demonstrate to our team is that it's not about, um, it's, it's, not about you know, what you look like or who you are, it's about being talented, hardworking, and putting in the effort, not necessarily about how young you are, uh, what ethnicity you are, or what gender you are. And that's something that is core to our team at Nomad Homes. A little bit about my journey. Um, so for me, I'm actually an investor by training. 
So I went to Wharton undergrad uh, to study finance and real estate. And if you've ever met anyone who went to Wharton, you'll know that we have a lot of finance people at our school. And so that was me too. So I started off in New York at Blackstone, which is one of the largest, actually it is the largest alternative asset management firm, uh, which means I was an investor in their private equity group covering consumer retail investments. Um, so that meant, you know, I looked at companies like Chobani, the yogurt company, and we were thinking about buying that. Um, you know, I invested in a company called Service King, which is a collision repair chain across the US. Uh, so companies like that. And while I was at Blackstone, I also had the opportunity to go work for the Chinese Sovereign Wealth Fund in Beijing. Um, so that was me helping them manage their US dollar assets. And then after that, um, I actually uh, moved to a family office in San Francisco to help them manage uh, you know, their multi-billion dollar portfolio before realizing that I did not want to be an investor for life. So despite you know, the prestigious companies that I had worked for, despite like doing the right thing and working in finance, which is also highly lucrative, um, you know, I didn't love it. And my personal philosophy is that in order to be great at something, you really need to love what you do. Um, so I thought going to business school was a really great opportunity for me to figure out what that was. And I was lucky enough to get into Stanford um, for their MBA program and moved to Palo Alto. And there, you know, I started pursuing my passion. And my passion was always real estate. So when I was a kid growing up, you know, my parents had rental properties and I'm the one who's like painting the walls and like fixing things. I'll offer my services as a painter to everybody on this call. If you need your apartment painted, I'm an excellent painter. Um, but that really sparked my interest even when I was young um, in, in real estate. And that carried throughout. So I actually studied real estate in undergrad. I think I mentioned that before. I worked at Goldman Sachs in their real estate banking group. Uh, my first investment was actually in a rental property. And so when I got to Stanford, I was basically like laser focused on property technology, trends in the US and also trends internationally. So how did I end up in Dubai? Well, uh, I was actually in Dubai on spring break when Kareem sold to Uber. And that was a momentous occasion for the tech community across the Middle East, just given you know it's the first multi-billion dollar unicorn that exited. And my connection to the company is, you know, my husband was actually the first US investor in Kareem. So we're very close to the team there and obviously very proud of the team for building such a great company um, and also selling the company. Um, so I started digging in in terms of you know, how do people buy and rent their homes across Dubai and also across EMEA, which is our target geographies. And I really thought that, you know, although the, the city has taken a lot of strides forward in terms of making the process better and more transparent, we still thought that there could be a lot of improvement for the customer journey. Um, so I actually dropped out of Stanford um, convinced my co-founders, Dan and Damien. Um, so Dan was in Silicon Valley with me. He was a senior product manager at Adapar, which is one of Joe Lonsdale's fintech companies. And Damien was running Uber Eats across the Gulf to start Nomad actually one year ago tomorrow. Um, so that's kind of how Nomad started. But if I explain my journey to you, that's like a, you know, seems like pretty smooth, did everything like great, uh, was able to do all of this. Um, but what I would say is actually, you know, there, there are definitely ups and downs across your journey. So one thing I would say is um, something that actually really impacted me is when I was at Blackstone, I actually really wanted to go to Harvard Business School. I did not want to go to Stanford Business School. Um, and I applied and I had, you know, great recommendations. I thought a great application and I got rejected and I was heartbroken, like literally heartbroken because I wanted to go to Harvard. I wanted to go to HBS and I didn't get in. Um, but at that point in time, you have two options. Either you sulk and you take defeat or you move forward. 
And so I probably sulked for a day, but after that I decided, okay, like I'm not going to sulk anymore. I'm going to move forward, figure out what else I want to do and then, you know, figure it out from there. And I'm incredibly fortunate that, uh, I was able to pursue my MBA. I, I did, in fact, go to Stanford. Um, and I thought that for my journey and where I am today, um, there's, there was no other place, there was no better place than to be in Silicon Valley at Stanford, at the GSB, um, to pursue my passion in property technology and also to pursue my newfound passion in entrepreneurship. So that's a little bit about me and my journey and also why I'm here. Again. Cool. So just again, a little bit about Nomad Homes and what we are. You can check us out at nomadhomes.co. But what we are is we're a technology company that's built for Dubai real estate. For anyone who's studied, you know, tech companies, uh, we are a transactional marketplace. That means that we are an end-to-end -end platform for our customers. You can search, view, and transact with us all in one go. And the service that we offer to our customers is that it's a concierge service. So what we do is we search for the homes for you, we schedule the viewings, whether it's digital, whether that's in person, we help you make the offer, negotiate the offer, we even help you move in. And the best part about all of that is we are your sole point of contact instead of working with you know 10 agents at the same time. And the other piece is there's no additional cost. Um, so in terms of renting, the 5% that you pay traditionally in Dubai, that's exactly how much you pay to work with us, but you get all of these, you know, added benefits of this concierge level service. Sometimes I joke with our team, you know, it's like flying Emirates business class versus flying in like economy class. Um, and that's kind of how we think about Nomad because we really are focused on making sure that the customer has the best experience possible. Great. Um, so in terms of some other key takeaways um, that I just wanted to share with you is that, you know, first I would say uh, you're never too young or too different to start a business. And I think that especially resonates with myself. So sometimes when I go into business development meetings or when I go into investor meetings, you know, between Damien and Dan and myself, sometimes people will say, oh, I thought like Dan or Damien was the CEO and the founder because they're, you know, white men. Um, but I am in fact the CEO. I am a woman. I'm Chinese American, uh, not in the US, not in China, but across EMEA and currently in Dubai. Um, so people are a little shell shocked when they see me introduce myself that way. But you know, I'm, I'm very proud of the company that we've built. And I know that the team is incredibly supportive of, of me as their leader. And the other thing I would say is it's not just me, right? Mark Zuckerberg was 19 years old when he founded Facebook. If you talk to someone in a traditional industry, someone will say, oh, 19 years old, that's very young. But look at where Facebook is today. And one of the you know, co-founders of the multi-billion dollar business Alibaba was Lucy Pegg. Um, and she's now chairing the finance arm of Alibaba. And that's an incredibly large company as well. And the final point I would say is that diversity is a great thing because diversity brings diversity of thought. It brings new perspectives, it brings new concepts, and it brings new directions. And ultimately, you know, it brings disruptive ideas and it should be embraced. So instead of saying, I wanna hire only Chinese American women on our team because I'm very comfortable with them and I believe that they're most similar to me, I actually disagree with that line of thought and think that having a diverse team makes your team even stronger um, than having a non-diverse team. The second piece I always say is, you know, your network is your net worth. And for me, this doesn't mean let me count up the number of LinkedIn connections that you have or the number of Instagram followers that I have, which by the way, is very, very few. I have very few Instagram followers. So clearly I'm not popular in that sphere of the world. Um, but, you know, when I think about my network, 
it's the number of people who I can rely on when things are going well and when things are going poorly. And that I think is the true value of a network. And that means that you need to spend time building those relationships, nurturing those relationships. For me, I believe that those relationships are not always just exchanging favors, right? I ask about someone's family, I ask about how they're doing, I will message them just to see how they're doing, right? Not necessarily, hey, like, would you mind making an introduction, you know, to this person because I wanna to talk to them. That of course happens, but to get to that point where you feel comfortable asking, you know, people uh, for favors, um, I think that takes time and that takes a lot of investment and foresight into who you talk to, you know, who you spend time with, and it does take time to nurture those relationships. All right, the final point is prepare for the extra scrutiny. Um, it may not be explicit scrutiny, but I think there probably is implicit scrutiny. Um, so as, as I mentioned, you know, when I said I walk into business development meetings, especially in the real estate sector, which is predominantly male, um, I say, hi, I'm Helen, I'm the CEO of Nomad Homes. And sometimes people are very open to it, sometimes people are skeptical, um, but it doesn't matter if they're skeptical explicitly or skeptical implicitly. You know, I have to make sure that people understand that, uh, you know, I am in fact leading and running this company. and people will look a little bit more closer when you're a woman in tech uh, because you look different from the majority of the people in the industry. And I would say, you know, that's fine. It just makes you stronger and you should be prepared for it. And so oftentimes what I do to prepare for that is one, I never walk into a meeting unprepared. I know exactly who I'm talking to. I know exactly the purpose of the meeting and I know what I want to achieve after the meeting. Um, so that level of preparedness makes me incredibly confident when I walk in. So that is how I mentally prepare ahead of a meeting. The second piece is to assert your presence. One, speak loudly. Uh, make sure you say, you know, hi, my name is X. You know, I am X role at this company. Um, I always actually like to speak first. Um, and that's something that I actually learned at Stanford in business school as the person who speaks first often registers their presence first. Um, so that's an implicit um, trick that I use as well. And I think, you know, just be confident because whoever you are, whether you're a man or you're a woman and you are prepared, you are qualified, you know, be confident that you are as such. And when you speak with confidence, people take notice. And I would say that's an incredibly important piece of, you know, if you want to be a leader, if you want to work in tech, and if you want to be successful. Um, so that is actually all I had in terms of prepared slides or prepared remarks. Um, I will stop sharing my screen, um, but, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions, dive into any topics, uh, it, anywhere. Um, so I will actually open up the floor to everybody else. Hello, Helen. Hi, Prasanna. Uh, in uh, today's market, like you know, every day, different technologies evolving, right? How do you update yourself every day, like, you know, with the uh, upcoming things and all? Great. That's a great question. Thanks, Prasanna. Um, and Sarah, I also saw your question, so I'll address that one next. Um, so in today's evolving technology, how do we become continuous learners? So... Okay, so first thing I would say is there's a technological piece. Um, and, you know, I actually don't have a technical background. I am good at math, but I don't know how to code. And so when it comes to technology and keeping up with the latest technology, that's where having a phenomenal engineering team comes into play. So I'm fortunate enough that Dan, who's our CPO and runs our tech org, you know, we have phenomenal engineers who are constantly learning the latest technologies. 
Um, and I rely on them to make sure they keep our company at the forefront. And then, you know, then we start implementing. And when we make structural changes or new, uh, you know, coding language changes, um, then I get looped in just to know what's going on and why we make these changes. In terms of, you know, personally always developing, I think it's really important to have a growth mindset. The growth mindset means, you know, you're not, you don't accept something the way it is. You think that you can change it. And I think that's really important in the way that I think about things for myself. Um, so in terms of the growth mindset, I would say one of the biggest things that I, I do is I constantly ask the question, why? Like, why is something done this way rather than another way? Why is, does this make sense? Why do we choose to do things this way and not the other way? And why is a great way to be curious about something and to learn more? And so part of that is I spend a lot of time on Google. When I don't understand something, I, I just start Googling things. Um, I read a lot. I read a lot of random stuff too. Not only like business articles, tech articles, I read human interest pieces. Um, because I think that curiosity and being insatiable when it comes to learning new um, skills, uh, new data, I think that's incredibly important for staying up to date. But at the end of the day, I think it's a mentality. I think it's a mentality of do you want to grow or do you want to stay the same where you are today? I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I will take these in order. Sarah, what are your tips for fundraising? That is a great question. So we are very fortunate that we have raised $4 million from venture capital funds in Silicon Valley. So our lead investor is Comcast Ventures, um, as well as Partech, Abstract, WonderCo, Precursor, and Class 5 Global. So those are our key investors in Nomad Homes. So what would I say about fundraising? I would say first, um, I would actually urge you to, to think about what kind of funding do you want? Do you want venture capital funding or do you want to bootstrap or raise from friends and family? Um, I, I know that being a venture capital company or a VC backed company, there's a lot of like uh, appeal to this, right? So Uber was one, Airbnb is one, um, a lot of high flying companies are. But with being a VC backed company comes a lot of expectations. And those expectations often revolve around growth. So it's not okay to just grow, you know, 20% year over year. People expect three, four X growth year over year. And so if your company is well suited to that, then I would urge you to go talk to the VCs. There are plenty of VCs in this um, in, in Dubai as well. Um, but if your company is not suited for that, that's totally okay, by the way. So for example, at Blackstone, I invested in a car repair shop. Like car repair shops make great money. You don't have to, you know, um, spend a lot of time investing in marketing. You don't have to do, you know, a lot of heavy tech investment. Um, so for that kind of a business, maybe it's better to just bootstrap it and then raise from friends and family or other types of investors who don't expect you to double and triple growth year over year. In terms of VC funding, I would say one, a couple things that VCs really look for. One is the, the kind of business that you're building. How big is the addressable market? Because a VC will only invest in a company if they think it has a $1 billion potential. That's just the portfolio map of being a VC. Um, the second piece is the team. Why is your team the right team to tackle the opportunity? So this is where I would, I would tell them about yourself, tell them about the team that you've assembled, um, and your ability to continue to attract A plus talent. And the third piece is, why is your company necessary? Um, and this oftentimes is product market fit. You know, why do customers like your product? Um, are customers using your product? How can you demonstrate traction? Um, often this comes in the form of, you know, revenue. That's the easiest way to demonstrate traction. Maybe you signed up customers. 
you know, maybe you have followers. Um, those are all different ways to demonstrate traction. Sarah, does that help? I can go into more depth on this one. Okay, um, I, will I will continue going through the questions. Um, Sarah, you can feel free to message me separately. Um, we can talk a lot about this. All right, Gonka. What challenges have you faced disrupting the property market here in Dubai? Who do you follow? Who are your mentors? Those are great questions. Um, so disrupting a real estate industry is really tough, not only in Dubai, but around the world. And that's because real estate is such a large asset class and people are used to doing things the way they are. So what challenges have you faced? Uh, first, I would say is changing the way things are done is quite difficult. Um, so as an example, how do you convince someone to not use WhatsApp as their CRM and start using Salesforce? Like, that is a huge mindset shift in terms of inputting the data, keeping the data up to date, um, allowing a central team to be able to see the data. And, and that's something that we face all the time. Um, the second thing that we faced, you know, how do you engender trust in a market that has, you know, little trust? Um, and that's something that we're facing now too, of why should a customer work with us why should you know other real estate companies work with us? I can say you know trust us. Uh, you know we are different. We're doing things differently, but sometimes that's not enough. So what we always do is we think actions speak louder than words, and that means we hold ourselves to an incredibly high bar of customer satisfaction, but also um, within the industry as well. We will do nothing that breaks that bond of trust because that is more important than anything else to us right now. Um, other, other things is, you know, I had to convince a lot of investors who traditionally invest in Silicon Valley to take a leap of faith on Nomad, which is, you know, do, it's targeting the Dubai property market, which is foreign to a lot of people. Why should people care? Um, and there are a multitude of reasons of that, but that took a lot of persuasion in terms of, we think that there is a huge opportunity here. Just look outside, there's buildings all over the place. Um, and also, you know, we think that we can really help the customer with their entire home journey. Okay, second piece, who do you follow? Who are your mentors? That's a great question. So in terms of personal mentors, um, I have a couple. So I have two former colleagues, they were my bosses, um, who are phenomenal investors and also phenomenal people. So they took an interest in my career when I was incredibly young and they didn't have to do that. So one was a, a very senior partner at Blackstone and one was very senior partner um, at the family office that I worked with. And so when someone takes you under their wing and shows interest, you know, reciprocate. Be thankful. Uh, and that's part of this building your network concept. They don't have to do this, but they want to do that. So reciproc reciprocate and tell them, thank you for doing this. Um, and you know, that, that will carry you a long ways. Uh, in terms of other mentors, I actually speak with a lot of CEOs in my network, whether they're in the fintech space or the prop tech space. Um, I find that talking to other entrepreneurs who are going through the same challenges as us is incredibly helpful. So, you know, I talked to Steve Lane, I actually have a call with him later tonight, who's the co-founder of Fly Homes in the US. Um, you know, we bounce ideas off of each other all the time and I ask for advice from him because he is in a similar field. And, and the last piece is I actually uh, take a lot of mentorship from our investors. So our investors see, you know, hundreds of companies every single month. They see successful ones, they see not successful ones. And so oftentimes I listen to them in terms of, you know, who, like what direction should we be going in? Um, do you think that's a good idea? Do you think that's a bad idea? And also in terms of what are they seeing that other companies are doing well? 
and maybe we can try that with our company. So that's kind of the group of people that I often speak with. I hope that was helpful. I will move on to the next question. All right, Neha, how important is it to stay lean in MVP and prototyping stage? Phenomenal question. Very important. Okay, so this is actually touching on a great point in terms of product market fit and talking to your customers. So I would say, like, get your MVP out as quick as possible and test it with people. The more customers you have running through your platform or your company, the more you'll learn immediately. And something about being in a startup that I think is really, really important, and everybody says it, but I will say it again, it's like, learn fast, fail fast. It's fine if your first product doesn't work, but at least you know. And then you need to ask your customers, why did it not work? Why don't you like this? What can we do better? What if we change this? Would you like that? Um, so like getting your product out into the market with the customers, testing it on the customers, and then taking that feedback is incredibly important, I would say. Um, so that, that is like such a great question, Neha, and like something that I can't stress enough. It's something that, <clears throat> excuse me, it's something that we're pushing our team to do every single day. Learn faster, fail faster, try more things. Um, because when you think your product is perfect and you wanna push it out there, that's too late. Like you should be pushing out a product that you're not totally like comfortable with because that's when, um, that's, that's how fast you should be running. Okay, um, Reem. Once you had your idea, how did you go about implementing it? Did you do all the research and planning yourself or did you start involving people right away? Great question, Reem. So um, in terms of implementing the idea, a lot of research was done by myself and that consisted of a lot of customer interviews, um, speaking with a lot of people who've searched, uh, who've bought a home, who've rented a home, understanding why they liked their process, why they didn't like their process. Um, so that part was done by myself. And then once we kind of had this idea that there was definitely something that we could improve, then you know I asked Dan to be my co-founder and then I asked Damien to be my co-founder so that we could do this, right? And the way we structured our co-founding team was, you know, not only do we like each other and trust each other, those are core principles, but importantly, our skill sets are complementary. So I have a finance and a strategic background. Dan has a tech and product background. Damien has an operations background. And so the three of us, um, you know, we thought that those were core pillars that we wanted to focus on for Nomad. And then, you know, and then we started going, right? Um, so then we started uh, basically like setting up our tech, building the MVP, getting the customers on board, making sure that we had the right people. And from there, I think, you know, we were kind of just running it with it uh, between the three of us. So I think that's what I would say um, in terms of, you know, I, I know we just talked about staying lean. Um, I would say starting a company is also an incredibly lonely journey in that uh, doing it by yourself may get kind of lonely. Like, I love talking to Dan and Damien because I know that they're there and I can bounce ideas off of them. And it just makes starting this company, you know, more like a family because it's really tough, right? Starting a company is forever an uphill battle. And you really need to believe that what you're doing is better for the customer and that one day you're going to succeed. And sometimes that's helpful if you have, you know, one or two other people who are always there next to you to support you every single step of the way and, you know, pick you up when you're feeling down and you pick them up too. Um, so that's something that I would say between the balance of staying lean versus having other people uh, with you when you're building a company. Okay. All right, so, okay, 
So Neha just put up another question. So I'm actually gonna answer this one first before Virginia. <clears throat> uh, how do you look for co-founders? Ah, that's a great question. That's a very tough question. Um, so I would say look within your network first because your co-founder is someone that you 100% trust at all times without a doubt. And that's really, really important. So that's why, you know, Dan has been a friend of mine for five years now and Damien was a friend of a friend. Um, without that level of trust, it's really hard to have someone, you know, be your co-founder because this is like, I call this, I'm, I'm married, but I call this my second marriage because I'm married to my co-founders and I'm married to the company. Um, so it's incredibly important to find someone that you trust. So whether that is a recommendation from a friend, you know, a colleague, uh, someone in your network, I think that's one of the best places to start. Uh, in terms of experience, um, I would say, the advice that I've heard is your experience and your skill set should be a little bit different. So having two people with finance backgrounds, it can work. That's not a question. But then when you're trying to run lean, you know, maybe someone needs to focus on ops and someone needs to focus on strategy or something like that. Um, so I think it's easier if you have diverse, uh, diverse skill sets, but it can definitely work if you guys have the same skill sets too. Okay, so now I'm going to go back up a question to Virginia. All right, thanks for your question. I'm interested in understanding how do you continuously improve your customer experience and win new customers? What types of data do you analyze given that if you are successful in helping someone find a home, they won't necessarily need your services again anytime soon? That is a really great question, Virginia. So unlike food delivery, buying a home or renting a home generally at most happens once a year. And so we don't have this luxury of, you know, repeat customers who come back very soon or the ability to rapidly test messaging because the transaction is infrequent. So what we do, and this goes back to listening to your customers, is Every time we work with a customer, whether they choose to transact with us or not, um, we want to talk to them. We want to say, what did you like about working with us? What did you not like about working with us? What can we do better? What did we do well? Um, and again, this goes back to talking and interacting with your customers. The other piece I would say is, you know, we do have dedicated nomad advisors for our customers, but Dan, Damien, and I are also servicing our customers. Like we are on the phone with them, helping them find their homes, scheduling the viewings for them, making sure that we're getting the best prices for them. And so I would say, you know, being close to your customer is also incredibly important because you will learn so much about what is their pain point, what can you solve for them. And so I think that's also incredibly important. Hopefully that helps. Thanks, Virginia. All right, going back. All right. Gonka, I hope I'm saying that right. What are your plans for year two? Uh, for year two, again, a lot of what we're doing is actually scaling up operations in Dubai. We're really focused on our product and technology to continuously offer more tech solutions for our customers and really just like double, triple down on the customer experience and how we can make it, you know, 10x better than where it is today. And so I think, again, it goes back to this growth mindset and continuous learning and listening to our customers. Alexandra, how important is tech skills and coding in the job market right now, especially within a startup? That's a great question and very relevant. Um, I wish I could code. Like, I really do wish I could code. Um, it's, it is a great skill to have, even, even if you're not a software engineer. If you can write SQL code, if you can write some Python scripts, like, it's incredibly helpful for you to be self-sustaining and for you to run even faster. 
And so as an example, you know, we do have user data stored um, across our platforms and the ability to run a Python script or even the ability to write, you know, Excel formulas to analyze that data is incredibly important. So that way I don't have to ask anybody to see what's going on. I can just say, oh, like, let me go get that data and I'll run it myself. And that often happens. Um, so I would say, you know, if you have it, that's great. If you don't have it, I think it's really important to at least be somewhat technical because it just turbocharges your ability to analyze data and make informed decisions based on the data that you're seeing. Okay, Roxana, what startup funds programs are available in Dubai? If I would like to start a tech company in Dubai, where do I even start? There are a couple of startup programs that I know of. I know that 500 Startups has a program um, for early stage companies. Uh, Hub 71 in Abu Dhabi, they also have a program for startups. Um, Astrolabs is a great place because there's so many startups there. Um, in terms of the venture funds, um, you know, I would say Class 5 Global, obviously one of our investors is a great uh, investor and partner and they help brainstorm um, ideas with early founders. Um, I think something that's unique about them is that they are, you know, a San Francisco based fund across global markets. So they see trends across the US, across Latin America, across Southeast Asia, and are able to translate those trends um, based on the customer base as well. So they're great brainstorming partners. Um, and of course, there are other VC funds as well. I think I think there are some other programs that are running as well in Dubai, but I'd have to get back to you on that one. Um, like I know there's the Mohammed bin Rashid um, Innovation Fund as well as uh, the DIFC FinTech Hive. So I think it really depends on what kind of company that you're starting and um, like who you want to work with. Are you looking for funding? Are you not looking for funding? Um, and, and that, so that, is something that I would look into, um, but I'm also happy to take that offline. Um, also, speak to the Astrolabs team. They have a lot of information about this as well. Great. Uh, what books or podcasts do you recommend from Sarah? That is a very interesting question. So. Since I started the company, I've definitely had less time to read physical books. Um, so I've actually turned more to listening and to newsletters. So in terms of listening, um, I often enjoy listening to the Andreessen Horowitz podcast. Um, I still think the Valley is a leader, if not the leader in tech. And from there, you can see trends in terms of what other companies are doing, what their partners are seeing. Um, and I think that's super interesting. Um, so that's a podcast that I listen to frequently when I'm like driving. Um, the other one I would say is there is one that's called, uh, there's, a, there's a fund in the Valley called NFX, so NFX, which stands for Network Effects. Um, they put out great content that I often like to listen to as well as First Round Capital, which is another you know, leading seed fund. Um, in the valley. And then the final one I would say is actually there's this individual called Lenny Rachetsky. Um, I think he is super knowledgeable about what he writes in terms of uh, like growing a startup, starting a startup. And he was a former growth product manager at Airbnb. Um, so he has great insights there as well. Um, so those are things that I like to listen to and I like to read, um, especially that are a little bit more short form and I can kind of like pick up and stop all the time. Great. What accelerator, okay, Neha asked, what accelerator and incubator programs are available in Dubai? Any focus about women entrepreneurship in Dubai? So I think we talked a little bit about that. 
in terms of accelerators and incubators. Um, for the ones that promote women entrepreneurship, I would actually have to check on that one. I'm not sure if there are dedicated um, entrepreneurship programs that support women, um, but maybe the Astrolabs team can help look into that one too. Um, but, you know, I'm happy to support women in entrepreneurship in Dubai. So if you want to shoot me an email, um, it's uh, Helen at nomadhomes.co. Um, you can shoot me an email. I can look into it. I'm also just happy to get a coffee with you. And then incubators and accelerators. Sarah just said, please feel free to contact her, Sarah at Astrolabs. There are a few female focused ones. Great. Okay. Sarah just answered, answered the question that I could not answer. Amazing. Any other questions? Questions have been great, by the way. Like, I really thank you guys because I don't like to just talk at a screen. I actually like the, the, the engagement. All right, so if there are no more questions, I would not be doing a service to our company if I didn't promote Nomad Homes. So visit us, nomadhomes.co. My email is helen at nomadhomes.co. You can shoot me an email. And if you are looking to move or if any of your friends are looking to move, whether that's buying or renting, um, feel free to reach out. Uh, I would say, you know, as a back to school promotion, we are offering a thousand Durham's off right now for renters, your, your agency commission and 3000 Durham's off your buyer agency commission. And so not only do you get concierge service through Nomad, you also get, you know, a thousand or 3000 Durham's off. So I will also be sending that out to everybody who is on this talk as well. Um, I will be your personal agent if you will allow me to do so. So thanks everybody. And what a great session and great questions. So I really appreciate it. And please feel free to reach out, grab me if I'm floating around Astrolabs. Bye.